Ferenc Mislivets, who you've met before. Um, he is the founder and director of the institute that sponsors primarily this summer university. He is a professor at the University of Pannonia. His research focuses on the problems of social development in East Central Europe and the search for alternative paths when faced with the challenges of global economic and regional crises, the European integration process and the development of democracy and civil society. He has conducted research and taught at prestigious universities and research institutes abroad. And he's also the founder of ISIS, the, the Institute for Social and European Studies, the predecessor of IASC. One of his main achievements is the development of the craft program, Creative City, Sustainable Region, that links soft indicators like culture and cultural heritage to hard factors like economics and infrastructure to regional development and cooperation. So the title of his presentation today is Afghanistan Forever. And then after that, we will have a panel discussion starting with the ambassadors online and I will give an introduction to them uh, before they speak. And so I give the floor to Ferenc Mislivets. Um, um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone, especially His Excellencies. Thank you for coming um, and being with us online. Um, I, I don't see... Oh, yes. Um, yeah, Mladen, you are here too. Um, yes, in, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, this hybrid experience um, is really helpful to enlarge the circle of participants, but it's not so easy to adapt yourself psychologically that friends are, are here and not here at the same time, but I'm very glad that we have a, a good number of perseverant um, um, applicants, and not all of them are students. So altogether, we had uh, in the last two days uh, between 60 and 70 people discussing very serious issues. I have to say that, um, I don't know if I, may I start? Can you, can you help me to? Um, to, to show the presentation, um, uh, that um, it's the 27th Summer University we have. And honestly speaking, we never had such a, a bleak and... Um, hello, come in, please. Don't hesitate, just come in. Sit down. Um, we never had um, such a negative, um, sad, and in many ways hopeless, um, word around us. We, we identified a lot of problems from the very beginning. 96 was the first year. Talking about um, an efficient um, um, understanding and dialogue between the East and Western part of Europe, uh, about divided societies, about the, the, the importance of exploring and, and, and understanding better ourselves, Central Europe, we, we discussed the problem of, of um, the Eastern enlargement, how the Western part of Europe is looking at the, the newcomers, you know, barbarians at the border, or <clears throat> Hannibal Ante Portas, that was one of the titles of our summer universities, and possible and impossible futures for Europe. So we did detect and identify big problems coming, upcoming unsolved problems. But we never had the imagination, and I'm including myself, that war in traditional form is going to come back. Basically in Eastern Central Europe, it's here in our neighborhood. Um, even after the first invasion of, of um, Ukraine by Russia 2014, even after that somehow, I think it's human mind, it's nature, I'm talking about myself, have been dealing with, with, with war, militarization, peace movements, um, arms race, etc. in the 80s quite a bit. Um, somehow, you don't want to believe that it's possible, that, that the past is, is taken back. It's a psychological denial. And it, it, well, we'll talk about it maybe in, in the discussion. It's a danger that, that our imagination stops somehow, that we believed that we achieved something and there's no way back. And this is, I would like to give you some, some images with some, I hope, short comments 
um, and to, to, to be able to associate different, different things which we never connected probably in order to start to analyze and understand this last 30, 35 years, um, which is, which this period is far from being a linear development. Um, so um, it doesn't work. Maybe you can, you can help me to, yeah, go back then. Um, here, we, here we go. Um, I mean, a little jumping back and, back and forth in time. This is 1990 May. NATO General Secretary Manfred Werner speaks to the very fact that we are ready not to deploy NATO troops beyond the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany, that included East Germany. I mean, not, not deploying anything in East Germany. Give the Soviet Union firm security guarantees. Here you see President Gorbachev at UN General Assembly 1988. It's called the anti-Fulton speech. Fulton was the, um, the place where Churchill gave the Cold War, the famous Cold War speech. Um, is the, the new thinking declaration, the end of Brezhnev doctrine, that means 500 troops, half a million soldiers, and 5,000 tanks, unilateral withdrawal from East and Central Europe. A little later in March in Vienna, there were decisions about uh, the withdrawal, unilateral withdrawal of conventional weapons, and in July, that was a very famous meeting, the Council of Europe Assembly uh, Gorbachev was um, a special guest, and he said very many important things. I quote one sentence, Europeans can meet the challenges of the next century only by pooling their efforts. They need one Europe, peaceful and democratic, a prospering Europe that extends a hand to the rest of the world. We see our future, I mean, the future of the Soviet Union, in this Europe. Um, just two, two years later, there was a coup against him where Yeltsin made him very prominent, and then he was a lame duck, and he was forced to resign. The 25th of uh, December, um, he's watching, he's looking at his watch, the very famous, very famous image. Um, so he checks time, um, on, his which, on his watch before his resignation speech. It's a very sad speech, and I, I, I recommend you to listen to it. Um, and with that act, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. So Gorbachev became a jobless person and a homeless. He, he did not have a homeland anymore. Um, and um, yes, so it's a jump. The Yeltsin came, uh, who actually was chosen by Gorbachev. That was mentioned yesterday that this president, so the first, um, the, the first man in the Russian uh, government, uh, were never really elected. They, they were, they were re-elected by, I mean, in a camouflage election, but usually they were chosen by their predecessor. So these are people demonstrating, thanks to Austria, this photo, when NATO was bombing in 99, Belgrade, the NATO bombing, we found some very good videos. The people were dancing um, and, and, and singing and having fun. Meanwhile, NATO was bombing um, um, Belgrade. And one of the reasons was that Russian troops um, showed up and there was a um, clandestine activity. The Chinese embassy was storing some weapons, some equipment. So that was actually a CIA operation, one-sided, and the CIA acknowledged it. The only um, uh, delivered and realized by the CIA itself to bomb the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. And at first, they, they lied about it. They said it was just an accident. And some times later, they acknowledged that it was not an accident. Um, yes, so we are in 99. Already here is Yeltsin. He also had to give up at the end of this year, and a very um, famous sentence from Yeltsin, I have fulfilled my life's mission. Russia 
will never go back to the past. So this is what he believed. This is what we believed. He, it was obviously, he had, we, we all know he was an alcoholic, etc. But he was still a man who was uh, on purpose yeah, working on a different, more democratic Russia. You should read this. I, I'm not going to read this um, New York Times article. Uh, very interesting how they um, saw him in that moment. Um, and he has chosen Putin. He said that um, I have to step down. A strong um, and, and, and energetic people should lead this country. And, um, and he has pointed on, on Putin. Um, and the first thing he did, Putin, um, uh, he did not interrupt his holiday a uh, couple of months uh, after his election when this very um, tragic situation occurred with the Kursk submarine. Uh, many, many soldiers, and hundreds and something, were, were for days waiting for rescuing them from the bottom of the sea. It never happened. Um, he didn't think it was so important. Uh, but he also started with very, very different um, rhetorics. It was the, the change was pretty fast, but not immediate, to an autocratic kind of rule. He pushed in his inauguration speech healthcare, education, culture, and he looked for many of the Western leaders a manageable guy, maybe tougher, maybe more of a hardliner. He's a KGB officer with a lot of experience from, from, from GDR, but manageable. Um, that was uh, going back a little bit. Here you see Nemtsov, who was a, a true believer of, of Russia. He was not a kind of hardliner uh, oppositionist. He believed that the Kremlin can be reformed. His suggestion was to get rid of um, the oligarchs and uh, you know this privatization business. And the Kremlin should be and politics should be re-nationalized. And that he started these reforms and pushed this. And it went. It, it Putin could use it very well um, and, and um, misuse it. And just a couple of years later, you remember that Anna Politkovskaya, who was the last very, very, very efficient fact-finding journalist, he was just shot down when he left her apartment in, in the corridor in 2006. Um, they, they really couldn't identify the, the, the murderers or some. They always find some Chechens, yeah, the possible, possible killers. And then another um, very, I would say, pro-Russia nationalist, but more liberal-minded person, very good-looking young man, um, uh, Boris Nemtsov, um, became more um, kind of an opposition uh, towards Putin. And he was just shot down nine years later in the famous bridge, um, not far from the Kremlin. Um, um, there was um, a famous... Um, uh, uh, sociological center, public opinion center named after Levada. They, they managed uh, to carry pretty free um, uncensored opinion polls um, from 87. They were slowly clamped down and, and, and ceased to exist. And um, in 2003, 4, um, the opinion polls suggested that there is a rising popularity for Stalin that's um, now I'm changing a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> that it, not Putin, it Russian population. Yeah. Nostalgia for greatness, for glory, and 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 for Stalin. Uh, and this so this Sovietization starts. What I want to say is that my hypothesis, if you want, it's not that a bad guy is coming and then he's responsible for everything and the US. With, with NATO and the CIA will, is going to push him out, and then everything will be okay. That's a, that's a typical, superficial, very misleading, very dangerous um, conception. Um, but media be, became more under state control, um, and Russia starts to re restore the old Soviet national, no, sorry, restore the old uh, Soviet national anthem. So re-Sovietization started. Um, why? Not because people Love the idea and, and, the, and the everyday life during communism, but it was glory. It was a glorious history for everyday Russians. And you know that. I don't want to leave because of the Second World War, because of you know, the strengths, the, the second or first, the superpower of the world, etc., etc. Um, 
So from 2003 on, um, it was an accelerated um, um, clampdown on civil society, democracy. Um, this is a very famous photo, and this guy is very active today, living in New York or London, I don't know, Khodorkovsky under arrest. It's a very good photo. Um, they um, nationalized um, the Putin clan, the, the uh, Luke Oil, the largest oil producer company, and, but even that time, Putin's party only reached 37% of the election. So there's still some remnants of democracy, of, of free um, opinion, um, um, and, and, and remnants of liberty uh, were still there. That was yeah, Gorbachev's dream to turn Soviet type of Bolshevik system into a, a European type of social democracy step by step. Now, then here, another very famous guy, Kasparov, started his marches, um, organized people. It was just marches for a democratic Russia, but nothing, how to say it, not against someone, not to create a new party and push out Putin, so to speak. Um, and he, he helped this organization to, to organize these demonstrations, and it went on for a couple of years. But step by step, um, and the, the, the Putin government was clamping down, and, the, and that in 2007, there was a new bill um, about against NGOs calling themselves useless paperwork. We don't need them, it's just paperwork. And then, then in 2008, with the very, very clear and very obvious physical crackdowns of these marches when they, they stopped marching anymore. So it took five, eight, 10 years to undermine and to push out, marginalize, um, threaten so-called civil society. It is not true that the Russians are unable to organize their own civil societies or movements. It's just a, a strong state with using military and, and secret police methods in a systematic and, uh, way. They can undermine and, 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 um, and imprison people, threaten them, and push them under uh, to, to, to the underground. So here, here are two famous, infamous sentences from, from Putin. Um, it was 2005, April, a State of the Nation address. Um, I think it's a basic sentence. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the country. Tens of millions of our citizens and countrymen found themselves outside Russian territory. And uh, a little later, in, or a little earlier, February, um, no, a little later, sorry, 2007 February, uh, in the famous München International Security Conference, he said, the process of NATO enlargement has nothing to do with the modernization of the alliance itself, or with raising the level of security in Europe. Just the opposite. It is a seriously inflammatory factor that lowers the level of mutual trust. And then he, is, he asks, well, what happened to the declaration? He's referring back to the declaration of Manfred Werner. Um, what I want to say with this is probably obvious that it took a couple of years for the new regime led by Putin um, to put itself in a situation where they, they can do basically everything if they want to start um, a new military conflict or if they want to show a more threatening military posture towards Europe, towards their neighbors. There was no obstacle anymore and they found the ideological, political um, justifications, step by step, and also the legal base they, they created bills around this. So it's probably similar um, in, than in other countries. The, uh, the, one of the major uh, philosopher, uh, an advisor of Putin, a guy called Dugin, um, who has huge tractatus about Russian history and glory and, um, and Europe's um, uh, misdeeds. And he started to organize his own counter movement after Kasparov's movement was seized. Um, and this glory to Russia, Russian Russia, we all know these this slogans, we call this uh, the liberal um, uh, democracy or illiberal 
um, ideology. Um, it started to idealize the past, and it's a very interesting mixture, mixture of Russian and Soviet past. It's, it's, a, it's mixed up in a, in, a, in a very interesting way. Well, these are my questions, and we can discuss it the next coming month, I think, what happened to democracy is transforming or it's dead, and we, we need to, 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 um, to start a new, a new democratic movement, or it's just a decline, temporary decline. Uh, it's, a, it's a global phenomenon. It's not only happening in Russia. Um, these are not dramatic charts, but they show that there's a, uh, there's a um, negative tendency in North America, especially in Latin America, a little bit in Western Europe. Um, here you can see the red um, uh, where, where there's, a, there's a backlash um, um, uh, of democracy. Um, still, I, I mentioned this yesterday that some people refer to the United States as the leading power, world power, uh, who are leading our democratic movement is very far from being. This is what 30 or 40, 50 years ago, uh, you could say that. It's very difficult to say today um, um, with, a, with a, the next president who, who organized uh, um, uh, an invasion um, uh, of, of right-wing groups against the capital. It's very, um, very difficult and uh, where, where abortion is forbidden. Um, so there's a global decay in my understanding, you might disagree with me, of democracy. I'm not suggesting that democracy is dead as such. A lot of regimes are calling them democracies which are very far from democracy. It appeals. But there is, we need to dig deeper because democracy's original meaning is the power of people. The original meaning is not, not the American type of liberal um, representative democracy which does not take into account people's will um, for, for economic well-being. It's, it's, it's only the last 50, 60 years where we identify democracy with one version of democracy, okay? All right, I, it's, I don't want to spend too much time with that. It, it, it's a, um, yeah, it shows the, 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 the last um, many point of backsliding democracy in the United States, in Latin America, in large parts of Asia, India, etc. So there is a there is a backslide, obviously, even according to um, institutions which are part of this liberal world. Um, so wars in Afghanistan, we all know that ten years um, Soviet invasion. That was um, in Gorbachev's memoirs everywhere. It's coming back that that was the how the last punch. They were punching out themselves at a hopeless war. Um, nobody believed in this war. Nobody believed from the Soviet side that they can win the war. And that was a um, 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 less than non-glorious end and defeat. And they left um, in 89. And that was already when the collapse was closed, the collapse of the Soviet Union. A very strong uh, resistance uh, by local forces, uh, basically the Taliban's. Um, and here you see Russian troops leaving Afghanistan. Um, and only 10 years later, the Americans already started to move in in 1990, but in 2001 it started in big. Um, the 20, 21 years war of US, the longest, longest war of US, um, um, which ended in a similar way. Um, so here you see this very, um, sad and, and, and shameful pictures when Afghans um, are trying to catch the last flight to, to, to leave, to escape um, Afghanistan, being afraid of the new com coming back, the comeback of the Taliban regime. It's still not completely understood uh, why it happened, but it happened in such a, a, a dramatic way that I, I think Russia, uh, Putin could easily draw the, the, the conclusion that the United States is very, very seriously um, um, weakened militarily, and that what probably that was one of the reasons why they decided that it's a good moment to start a war. That's my opinion. Maybe um, his excellencies have a more profound um, opinion and, um, and more detailed one, and they can disagree with me. Um, so um, I use, of course, Afghanistan forever as a metaphor because uh, the mission of the Americans were to uh, first 
you know, to, to, to bomb out um, Al Qaeda, uh, which found, um, which was able, Bin Laden was hiding for a while in, in Afghanistan. Um, but then the mission was, was changed. Was, the mission was to, to build democracy. And Obama said it's still an important war, um, but we should also support civil society. And uh, basically, they did do a lot of important things, but all the regimes were corrupt. They, 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 they were supporting, and the local forces just gained more and more strength, basically the Taliban's. And at the end, they said, now there was a, the latest declaration from Biden that all the Taliban's have the right to, 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 to share power, and they should, they should show how, how can they stabilize the situation. So 21 years bloodshed and violence, a lot of collateral damages, killing innocent people of, of civil society, led to a conclusion that, no, let's, let, let, let's have the Taliban back. Let's think about it. And obviously, this is not over. If the violence is not over, then nothing was solved. The two superpowers did this for more than 20 years, 25 years, and the situation is worse. But it's not just Afghanistan. Um, and here is the very interesting, we don't, don't talk about it. We talk about Ukraine for good reasons, Belarus, Belarus, and on the Baltics and Moldova, how the war can escalate. But if you look at these maps, this is Syria, Turkey, refugees, um, refugees, Syrian refugees supported by Turkey or supported by, by, by the Islamic states. And um, so hotspots everywhere. And we have a promise from Erdogan to clamp down um, on this border region. Um, uh, Syrian refugees, they are creating, according to the Turks, a lot of tensions. So, so they need, need to be um, controlled militarily. And here is the trick. Russians are involved, of course. Russian military is involved in this conflict. But because the Russian army is big, but not infinitely big, they had to withdraw some of the troops to, to wage war in Ukraine. Immediately, um, uh, Syria, Iraq, and Iran started to be more involved, and, and Erdogan um, got the upper hand. So there is a, a, a very vicious interdependence between, um, uh, between Russia and Turkey. And Erdogan, um, you know, that he tried to, to stop NATO enlargement, suggesting that Sweden is supporting terrorists, namely the PKK, KK. Um, the, because Kurdistan is the, the biggest question, the in, so-called independent Kurdistan. And the Kurds um, um, are the enemy number one for Turkey and supported by the US. In other words, the two strongest army within NATO, yeah? Turkey, um, United States and Turkey, are in violent clashes in, in the Middle East. And that is something hard to, to understand. Yeah? And, and there's a lot of, lot of contradictions, who can and who cannot be a member of the NATO. The same question we can be asked, and not going to in, into details, who can and cannot be under what conditions member of the European Union? Why to play this game with the Macedonians, the Serbs, and, and the Albanians for so long? What is the EU going to do now if they, if they offer um, membership to Ukraine and Moldova, telling the Macedonians that, oh, you should wait another 10 years maybe? You heard um, you, you, the comments of the Macedonian um, prime minister. Very, very tough words a couple of days ago. Um, there was a meeting with, with um, the Western Balkans and, um, and the EU, and, and he just said, he told the European leaders that you guys, you are a mess. You are promising one thing in the morning and you, you say the opposite in the evening. You are you're in a mess. And um, they couldn't say anything. So here is a map again, no, no answer, because they are a mess, you know, unfortunately. So um, here you see um, where refugees are located, Syrian ref refugees in Turkey, about 3 million people. The border region, the, the red, 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 um, uh, dark red is the most dangerous one. Um, the statistics, only, I mean, uh, only in, um, in Istanbul, half a million refugees from Syria. Um, 
Now, and this is the last one, the Suvalki, um, the Suvalki uh, corridor, which according to um, mainstream media, the most dangerous place today in the whole world, the Suvalki Strait is, um, is, is a 70, I don't know exactly how many kilometers, 70, 100 kilometer long corridor, uh, which um, connects uh, Belorussia to Russia. The, the little enclave or outclave of Russia is um, Kaliningrad, used to be Königsberg, where Kant um, formulated his eter eternal peace, famous book, Eternal Peace. Now, um, well, we, 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 with some militia, we could say the eternal war um, for Europe is probably formulated here. If, if the Russians are taking it over, then, then they can cut the Baltics, all the three Baltic states, from, from um, the EU uh, geographically. Uh, here you go. The German troops located Canadian and British troops in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. You can, this, this little black one is the Suvalki Gap. And again, down there, more and more American um, NATO troops in Poland. Um, but Belarus, Belarus is already openly um, uh, supporting Russia with everything, so basically occupied by the Russian army. Um, so the situation is very, very severe. In my understanding, here is Königsberg in um, 1895, uh, after the Second World War in 40, uh, at the end of the Second World War in 45, and today um, already a, a beautiful um, a set of images. And here are these three guys um, in 35 years. Three presidents, and um, there's an interview with Gorbachev. Maybe um, too much. I used too much time. But it's, a, it's an eight minutes interview. It's worth to listen. I don't know. You can. It um, it was um, broadcasted recently. It was um, it was made a little earlier. Um, but if you don't mind, if you are interested, um, Benza can play it for you. Uh, shall we or? Shall we go for the discussion? Okay, good. Then, yes. So, won't listen to now. So, my last, my last, my last. No more? One, one more. Yes, so questions to everyone, um, not only about Russia and Ukraine and Europe, um, but what happened, what, what is happening? We should, even if it is very difficult to answer in that, this moment, we should start to think about it. Uh, how long will the war last? Can it be turned into a semi-frozen hybrid conflict, which is my fourth scenario, it's not not Kortunov's um, uh, revolution, it's verse. And as such becoming quote unquote perpetual. Uh, already uh, my hunch is that we started to um, get used to the idea here in Europe that, that that war is the new normal of our everyday life. Yeah? Um, uh, and so what, what should we prepare for? Fortress Europe, um, uh, entrenching ourselves towards the world. If you, I want to show you more maps, but it's obvious, we're talking about the sanctions. Yeah? Everyone is criticizing Hungary in Europe. But if you look at the world map, what percentage of the world is supporting sanctions, and, uh, sanctions against Russia? It's a very little minority. <laughs> a very little minority. Africa is very decisively silent. T telling the Europeans, you don't care when we are dying out of hunger and out of thanks to wars, etc. You don't let us to come to Europe. Why should we support your sanctions, which are actually um, further, um, um, further um, um, uh, killing our people um, uh, or putting a lot of economic burdens upon us? Um, India is obviously not supporting. China is not supporting. So who is supporting it? The Anglo-Saxon world and, and the European Union um, um, member states. It, it should be discussed because there are very interesting articles for, for economists especially, how many new burdens the sanctions uh, put on the shoulders of weak and poor societies. 
And that's your question we discussed yesterday about uh, state security, traditional conventional security, and human security, okay? So these are my lingering questions. Will hybrid war become the new normal? I hope someone has a good alternative. So thank you very much. Sorry.